Welcome to the podcast for the West Side Church of Christ that meets in Killeen, Texas. Today we bring you another practical lesson from God's inspired word, the Bible. Good to see everyone this morning. I do want to thank everyone for the prayers and everything that's been offered for my family's behalf. It's been a rough, rough one. And I want to talk about that this morning, but I want to start here because I want you to think about something else to help, I think, gain some perspective. I want you to imagine that you're with a friend, having lunch, hanging out, whatever it is, and uh, their phone rings, and they take the call, and they start having a conversation, and you're kind of feeling like, what's going on? <laughs> Left out, maybe a little upset. But then it really takes a turn when your, your friend, whoever it is, starts getting upset. You realize, let's just say they're talking to their spouse, and they're upset. And you're, again, you're, you're sitting there wondering what's happening, wondering why they're upset. And maybe it escalates and it gets pretty bad. And they hang up and they're crying. They're just visibly and horribly upset. And you say, well, what happened? And they say, uh, you know, say if it were April, she says, well, Mike said something that really upset me. And you're, you're now angry too, right? You don't know why. You're angry too. And maybe you're angry at me if it were April sitting there across from you and that happened. You're angry at me. What did, you know, you know me. You go, what did he say, right? What did he do? What's going on? Um, she's not really able to communicate it because she's upset or again, right? You're in that situation and you're, you start to just get sort of built up in anger and anger and angrier. And then when things finally calm down and you actually can have a conversation, you say, well, what happened? Well, he said something that upset me. What did he say? Why is he being mean to you? Yada, yada, yada. And he goes, no, no, no. She goes, no, no, no. Uh, you know, something happened, right? Something happened. It wasn't that he was mean to me. It was that he told me about something bad that happened. And you have to go, oh, you know. You, now, now you realize... I wasn't the person, or you know, again, the person on the other end of the line wasn't the person you'd be angry with, but you were, at least for that brief time. You've been there, right? We've all been there. We've all been only privy to part of the conversation. Isn't that what happens when we only see a part of the picture? We get the wrong ideas, and we look at, we're only seeing a little bit, and we're not seeing the whole thing, and so that makes us feel differently than maybe we should if we had a bigger picture? Is that not what happens when we say things like, why did God let this happen? Right? How could this be? And the reason we ask the question isn't because we're trying to be out of place or what or anything like that it's just that we are ignorant of what's really going on and so we make these judgments before we have the full story and so we're like this we're looking just at a little piece of the total and we don't understand everything that's going on and so again, like when our friend's on the phone and they get upset and we start thinking and making assumptions because of just what we're hearing, just the little bit that we're getting, this is what happens, this is what we're doing when we question God. Isn't this what was happening with Job? You remember Job, right? This is, that whole book is an illustration of what happens when no one has or when everyone doesn't have the full picture, right? So, remember, we the reader in the beginning of Job are given a glimpse of something that happened that no one else in the story saw. We have this, this scene with God and Satan, right? And, and God says, hey, what are you doing? And Satan, well, I'm wandering around causing trouble. And God says, well, look at Job. Look how righteous Job is. And Satan says, I bet he wouldn't be if you let me at him. And God said, I'll take that bet because you're wrong. It's kind of weird to think this, but I don't even think Satan has the full picture here. God does. Satan is either just 
humongously delusional, or he doesn't have all the pieces either, and I suspect that's the case. And so he challenges God, and he challenges Job, and if you're familiar at all with that, you know, God uh, basically allowed him to do anything he wanted to Job except touch him, so he killed his family, and he took all his wealth. He lost ten children in one day, and he lost all of his wealth in the same day, basically, and, and yet he was faithful. He mourned, of course. He was grief-stricken, heartbroken, for a number of reasons. Who wouldn't be? He'd have to be a, a machine. And yet he's, he refused to, to curse God and die. His wife said, because God, cause Satan came back to God, remember, and said, well, you know, a man will do anything for his health. And, and he's just about right, I think, in the end, right? Who wouldn't? How many of us wouldn't wind something back to have something, you know, fixed, right? To get some, something back from when we were younger. And God said, okay, just don't kill him. And so he just basically tortured him with this horrible disease. And yet, again, he refuses to submit to Satan. He refuses to denounce God. And his wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? His wife should have seen the same picture that Job was seeing, which was an imperfect picture, but all she could see was Job's suffering. She didn't see the whole picture, and she said, curse God and die. She forgot about the big picture that God has given to us. But Job wouldn't do that. And then remember, Job's friends came. That's why we have the, the guy on here with the finger pointing at him. His friends came, and um, they thought they were doing some good. We had a little service yesterday for Sonny, and my father-in-law came. He was here but last week, came all the way back to talk. And he mentioned this here, and he said, if only Job's friends had just stayed quiet, you know, things would have been different. I'm not advocating silence, don't get me wrong. But what they did was, they, they saw what they thought was the full picture of why this was happening to Job. And they said, every one of them said, Job, you must be hiding something. You must have done something wrong. You, there must be something here that you're not telling us. Every one of them accuses Job and said, because this thing is happening, then this is, we know, right, how the world works, and so that's why this thing is happening. And Job kept saying, no. I mean, he never denied that he was a sinner, but we, we're told right off the bat that he dealt with those things in the way God wanted him to. Right? He made the sacrifices. He took care of business. But he said, no, I'm not hiding anything. I'm not, there's no reason for this. Right? His friends had a completely inaccurate picture of how things work. And they then made judgments on that. And they accused him of wrongdoing on that. And then Job himself, though he can see a bigger picture, he still doesn't have the full picture. Because he's asking, and again, legitimately, why, God? I didn't do anything. And really, you remember, God's answer doesn't come till the very end. After all of his friends, you know, have their speeches, and Job kind of rebuts them a little bit, and then they come back and they say, no, no, no. And then God finally answers, and he kind of, he's talking to Job, and there's about two chapters where God says, Job, you have no idea what you're talking about. You cannot possibly see everything that I see, because you're a man, and I'm God. And he wasn't trying to belittle Job or talk down to Job. He was just stating a fact. Where were you when I made all of this? And you can't say anything in the face of a question like that, not as a, an honest human being. Again, he wasn't being unloving or anything. He said, Job, you don't see everything that's going on. And very literally, Job didn't see the, 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 that courtroom scene that we see, right? that we read in those first two. Job never saw that. God never told him about it. Job didn't have the whole picture of what was going on. And yet, Job was able to say, I'll be okay with that. Now I want to die. <laughs> he said that. I wish I had never been born because this is terrible. But he wasn't suicidal. He was, again, stating, I think, a fact. I wish this had never come to be. And yet, God didn't chastise him. He said, I'm going to take care of you anyway. 
And then, of course, he restored all of that he had lost, at least as far as one can. Even God can't fix that, I guess, right? Gave him more kids and more wealth and everything. But again, it's all about missing the total picture, right? Not seeing the whole picture, and that's why those questions come, and that's why we get angry, and that's why we challenge God. You know, if you think about David, a guy who went through a lot and wrote about it, that's what's great about David. He suffered a lot of stuff. You and I have suffered or will suffer a lot of stuff. It's just the way this world works, right? Maybe not exactly like David or me or you, but they're suffering. But David wrote about it. And if you read all the stuff that he wrote about it, he always writes stuff like this. Psalm 107.1, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Now, actually, if you read that psalm, His love endures forever is every other line. Do you think those people needed to be reminded that His love endures forever? His love endures forever. After everything they said, His lo- and actually I think the psalm is meant to sort of be a, kind of a sing song where there's a leader and then someone does it. In fact, I think Harold uh, Edwards did that for us one time years ago. And he read the psalm and there was this call and response and His love endures forever. We, for- we forget that. And the part of the reason we forget it is because we're not, we can't. And that's part of the problem. We can't see the whole picture, but we can see enough of it, like Job, to manage it, to get through it. Another place he wrote in Psalm 34, verse 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who fa- takes refuge in him. Psalm 34, 8. And just on and on and on. And David, uh, you know, was anointed king, and then he's chased around, and, and, and several attempts of murder on him are made by Saul, the king, and his men, and he's chased around, and he's living in caves, and he loses basically everything. And yet he said, I'm still faithful. And then, of course, he sinned, like the rest of us, and had a son, and God said, that son's not going to live. This is part of your consequence and he prayed and he fasted and he wept and the child died and he said i can't i I can't bring the child to me but i'm going to go to him i mean it's an amazing little um passage brian wrote a really good song about it by the way And, and you know again david's not perfect either no one is David had his faults, his sins, but through his whole life as he suffered indignity or problem or, you know, challenge, his son's challenging his throne and again trying to kill him and just on and on. And some of that's, again, the consequence of choices he made, but some of this is just the way life goes and he yet remained faithful. And today he stands as as an image of someone that we should want to be like in many ways. So, it, but so when he writes, you know, he's writing from here. He's writing what he's feeling, what he's thinking, and he's upset. He's angry. He's grieving. He's uh, you know heartbroken. All the different emotions that we all feel, and yet it, almost every psalm he says something like this: How great God is! How much! How loving God is! How much he loves God! Because again, he can see enough of the picture. Remember that God is good. And that's the lesson I want us to think about this morning. God is good. Not just God is good. God is good all the time, right? Because either God is good or God is not good. There's no sort of good. God, remember, God's not one of these uh, like gods of the pagans that's as, as wishy-washy as you and I can be sometimes. He's not given to whims. God is good and righteous and 100% perfect and, as we've already seen, loving. And Scripture is full of this. God is good all the time. And how do I know this? Well, let's go back to the beginning. God made this world and universe and then made us in His image. He made it perfect. We broke it. But think about this. God did all that knowing we would break it. And then He didn't say, well, it's broken. You know, like you do sometimes when you're you're making something. Nathaniel and I made a couple of cabinets that we 
unmade because <laughs> they didn't conform to the standard we wanted. You've done that, right? Kids play with Play-Doh and different things all the time, or I'm sure, you know, Anna has drawn occasionally a bad picture. Throw it away. God didn't do that. God does this knowing what was going to happen in the Garden of Eden, and he already had a plan in place. That's evident when you read Paul's writings about this eternal plan that God had, read Ephesians, and he set it in motion, and he told Adam and Eve, get out of the garden, no more tree of life for you, but there will be victory over this problem of sin. And then later he chooses uh, Noah. Why? Because God is good, right? People decided to be as evil as you can possibly imagine, but there was this guy Noah, and so God said, you know what, I'm not going to start over. I'm going to save Noah and his family, and we'll start over that way. And he remade the shape of the earth, but here we are, because God is good. God keeps doing this throughout history. Eventually, he chooses Abraham to start this physical process of bringing about the way, the person in Jesus Christ, who is going to fulfill all these promises God has made, through whom the plan has been brought, as Nathaniel talked about. As a lot of the songs Isaiah led reminded us of, that it is through Jesus Christ that all of this is made possible, that we're here at all. It's the only reason I'm here. And so, again, through Abraham, promises are made and a bloodline is established, and then you just go on and on and on through history and how God protects the people and he loves them and he cares for them. They did dumb things. They sinned individually and, and nationally. You know what happened? They were punished. And yet God didn't wipe them out. Remember later, he's going to kill them all the, in, the, in the wilderness. And Moses says, come on, God, don't do that. Show, you know, show us how loving and powerful you are. And God did. He kept them. And he kept going. And he sent him the judges. And he sent him the kings. And he sent him the prophets. And finally, he kicked them out of their land altogether because they were evil. And yet, what did he keep saying? I will take care of you and bring you back. I will create a kingdom where this kind of stuff will not happen anymore. I mean, how great is that? Again, only through the blood of Jesus. And so then, he, then Jesus finally arrives... Last week we spoke about John the Baptist and how he, you know, how great he was and how we can be much like John the Baptist. Remember what John's primary job was, was to prepare the, the people to receive the Messiah, this person that God had been talking about from the beginning. And they missed it, most of them. But there were people who saw it, who recognized it, who followed him, right? And he brought him here. And not did, did he just bring him here, he had him killed here. I love that song that Isaiah led before the Lord's Supper. Not only is it just a beautiful song, but I think the music and everything just really work together to really make you just... I mean, it's hard not to cry. Thinking about what Jesus did, what, what God did. Why? Because he's good. Because he's good all the time. And so we see these things. We read about those things. And again, you know, Paul then, Jesus, of course, uh, dies on the cross, but he is raised on the third day by God. And that then proves to us, as Paul would write over and over, that we too can be resurrected and raised from the dead and therefore saved. You know, and all of this, because God is good. And he's good all the time. If God's not good all the time, he's not good. Right? And so if our faith is one that says, well, I'm fine with God as long as things are good, then we're missing who God really is. And what we're doing, again, is we're only looking at things through that one little window, right? We've got the wrong glasses on. We're only seeing a part of the picture. Now again, we, as human beings, can never fathom the entirety of the picture of the process that God is taking us through. We can only see the little corner that we reside in, right? And it doesn't always make sense. In fact, it often doesn't. 
And so we have to then step back and remember that God is good all the time. And I can't, I can't figure out, right, I can't rationalize why this happened to Drew and Shaley, to the rest of us. Or why Beckett has, has his, you know, illness. I don't know. Or why things have happened to you. And you've all been there, again, unless you're just really young, right? We've been there. Or why this, that, or that. I don't know. You know, sometimes I can attribute it to my own foolishness and sin, like, like David with Bathsheba and that child dying. David knew exactly why that child died. But most of the time, I just don't think that's the case. We'll never know. We'll never know what's going on. We'll never know why. And we're not ever going to, at least until eternity is here, if you will, and as far as we're concerned. But if we recognize then that God is good all the time, then these things become, um, you know, difficult. Again, it's no less difficult. It's no less. It's not like we shouldn't grieve or shouldn't be upset or shouldn't uh, wish things were different. But it helps us get the perspective, kind of like Job had that, and David, I will, I will, will be. It'll be okay, right? It'll be okay. Because God is good. Not because I'm good. Not because the church is good. But because God is good. And what God has done. And it... We've got to be careful, again, that we're not asking the wrong questions. We're not trying to suss out exactly why all this stuff happened. Because that's a futile thing to do. All we're going to do is get upset and get angry and we're going to miss the point and we're going to miss how great God is. We're going to miss all the blessings that God has provided to us as well. We're going to miss the fact, really, that He did all this to save us. How, you know, little Sonny fit into that, I have no idea. But it, it, it helps you think, doesn't it? You know, a lot of scriptures tell us it's better to go to the house of mourning than the house of laughter, right? Again, David said that. Not because he thought funerals were great and death is great, but the, the honest truth is those are the things that make us think more about eternity and about uh, our lives here and about what that means. Um, so when we stop thinking, stop, stop knowing, that God is good all the time. That's when we get ourselves in trouble. That's when we're Job's wife and we say, curse God and die. God has no reason to be cursed. He's never done anything wrong or evil in any way that would uh, even earn a curse, if you will. We're just not seeing it because we can't see all the pieces to the puzzle. We can't. So then comes back to the trust and the understanding of exactly who God is. I love Proverbs chapter 3. Uh, verses 5 through 8. So you know, Solomon here is sort of tabulating all of his wisdom for his children and for us. Unfortunately, his son didn't listen too good. But you and I can. And here he says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. See, that's, that's what I'm talking about, right? I've got to trust God because He has the whole picture and He's good all the time and He loves me. Therefore, I need to trust that everything that takes place, whatever it is, will work out in the end. Even the dumb stuff that I do that creates, and if we're all being honest, is what creates much of our trouble. But not always. We lean on our understanding and we put ourselves in the wrong place and we ask the wrong questions and we start thinking and feeling the wrong way. The next thing you know, God's over there and we're over there. Because we don't understand something. Yeah. Solomon had it right. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. You know, um, we're told, right, that God will lead us. Jesus says there's a broad way and a narrow way. Pick the narrow way because the narrow way leads to life. God has always told us exactly which way He wants us to go. It's we who veer from that. Acknowledge Him, He will make straight your paths. 
Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be a healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. I mean, there's just that, right? When we do better, we are better. And we feel better. But we still live in this world that's, that's broken, that this stuff happens. Our accidents happen. People get sick. Babies don't come when they're supposed to. So what do you do? Give up? Say, God must be, he must not be loving. He must not be caring. He must not be good. Or he's not powerful. But that's just, again, we're trying to make sense of something that we can't possibly make sense of. Try to imagine eternity right now. Try to imagine God who knows everything and how that works. Can't be done. You couldn't write about it. You couldn't make it up. You couldn't put it on paper or describe it in such a way that anybody could understand it because it's impossible for us to understand those things. And that's part of the, the again, the, the challenge, I guess, that we have. And so let's take what Solomon said and let's do that. Because that will work. And God said that'll work. And Jesus said that'll work. Jesus said, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laid and I will give you rest. He said, that's how it works. The rest comes at the end. But you know, you can have spiritual rest now. Your body may not be at rest. we got to work. Maybe you're in pain. Um, your heart may not be at rest because we're grieving the loss of loved ones and things like that. I mean, this again, this is what the world is. But your spirit can be at rest because you know you're safe in the arms of the Lord. That only happens when you commit to the Lord. Follow Him. And, you know, again, there's much more to be said about what that means, but... It does begin by following Him, by taking His hand, by letting Him lead us to where we need to go. Remember, God is good all the time. And so if we follow Jesus, we're following God, every step is good. Every step is in the right direction. It's when we take our hand out of His and we decide to go some other way for whatever reason. I don't understand. I don't like it. It hurts. That's when we get off track, and there we are all of a sudden on the Broadway again. So this is where it begins. And again, I, I couldn't even write this down because I didn't know how, but God is good. Bless the Lord. Right? That is the answer to stuff like this that happens in all of our lives. God is good. Praise the Lord. We're going to sing this song, Because He Lives. I only asked Isaiah to sing the song, God is Good. He picked all the other ones and uh, did a really good job. Um, And again, everything that we're talking about here does come to the one fact, as this song is going to teach us, that he lives. Jesus died, yes, but he was raised. Paul, in all of his writings, will argue this. You know, sometimes Paul's hard to read and difficult. It's, if that didn't happen, then all this is a waste of time. If you don't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, then what's the point, right? And if I didn't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, I don't think I'd be standing here right now. I think I would have been long gone, to be honest. And, but here's the, you know, here's something to think about. If that had never happened, or I didn't believe that, I'd been long gone. I never would have, you know, who knows where that line would have been broken. Never would have even gotten to the point where we could even think about that grandchild and dream about her and lose her. Never would have got there. Never would have got to some of them, probably. I mean, think about it, right? We dwell on these things that are so awful, and it was awful, it is awful, and yet we forget all the blessings that are surrounding us all the time. But it's because He lives. 
God's the one who brings and gives the good and perfect gifts. God's the one, who, again, who gives us the reason. We just can't see the big picture. But God said, I've got it. I've got it in hand. Trust me. I love you. I will take care of you. Follow me. It'll be fine. That's where we are. That's the only place we can be. Beyond that, we've got nothing. I want you to think of that. We're going to sing the psalm, Because He Lives. Again, this starts your, with a journey to become a child of God, which means you must understand that He is the Son of God, that He did come and offer Himself as a sacrifice and die and was raised. As I said, Paul would argue that's fundamental. And you need to then understand that if that's the case, if you believe that, then you need to respond. And that response involves things like repenting of your sins. That'll be a lifelong endeavor, by the way. Confessing publicly this fact that you know about Jesus, that He's the Son of God, being baptized for the remission of those sins, to go down and up in the water, this burial. Read Romans 6 again, one of my favorite chapters, as you know, and it explains what all that means, that we are buried, that we're washed, we come up a new person, and then we, we walk, we live. And you know what happens while we're walking and we're living? We fall down, we get hit by a truck, and we get back up because God's there. You know, I've told you this one before, ancient Japanese proverb, fall down seven times, get up eight. And God's hand is there. Come to me all you uh, labor and are weary and I will give you rest. We're going to sing this song. If you need to come to the Lord, if you need prayers, help, whatever, let us know as we stand and sing. Thanks for listening. We'd be happy to answer any questions you have. If you are ever in the Colleen area, we'd certainly love to have you worship with us. You can learn more about us and our times of worship at westsidecolleen.com. Tune in next time and be sure to subscribe to our podcast. All together worthy, all together wonderful to me.